like examiner and a former tutor in a secondary school. Uh, we, we, we promise you to bring you lesson 16 and the other lessons. And in lesson 16, you're going to look at one of these uh, topics that become very complicated for a lot of, a lot of students all over. And we're going to look at, in lesson 16, we're going to look at what I call the National Income Accounting, right? We're going to tease that issue so that you understand uh, a lot of issues that borders on national income very well. They need to do this and these uh, training concepts that borders on so that you get that sort of agility when it comes to handling national income accounting. So in this lesson, let's go what we have for today. We're going to look at what are some of the outline here. We're going to look at the introduction. We're going to look at the importance of national income estimates. We're going to look at the three approaches and the, what, the circular flow of income. How does circular flow of income help us to understand the three approaches? We're going to look at the item that's clear from national income accounting estimates. We're going to look at the expenditure approach. We're going to take all the three approaches and take examples and solve them. We're going to look at the expenditure approach. The product approach or output approach or value added approach. We look at the income approach. We're going to look at some of the problems encountered. Problems encountered during national income estimation. We're going to look at the difficulty in comparing countries based on the per capita income. We're going to look at some. We're going to look at uh, nominal GDP, real GDP, GDP deflector uh, estimator. We're going to, so within the. Uh, the approach is expenditure approach, product approach. Now, we're going to do estimations of data response, and I'll give you some trial questions. So there are a lot of, a lot of things packed here for you. And I know after this, it's going to clear all your doubts. Anything you don't understand about national income, you're going to nail it down here. So you don't have any problem again. If you're not income, I'll estimate again. So let's see what we have. Let's get the introduction. Let's get the introduction. What is national income in the first place? It is the sum of the incomes received in a, in a year by the nation's factors of production for their contribution to the economic activities. Basically, the concept is used to measure the monetary value of the flow of output of goods and services produced within the economy over a period of time. So what is the national income? National income, for instance, at every point in the year, a country should be able to tell us how the country will be very productive. How, can, how has the managers of this economy shown some sort of agility? How have they shown the ability to increase the level of productivity? Or, in other words, how they be able to potentiate the level of economic activity. So you yourself, every day, when you write exams, you're able to assess yourself. Have I passed the exams or have I failed? So even individually, we always assess our productivity to see, are we doing well, are we not doing well? In the same way as economy too, at every point in time, we should be able to know the value of the economy. Is the economy being productive or is being going down? Some countries have been going down, down, down. Countries have become perennial and achievers. They are not progressing like Greece. The economy is always, GDP is going down. So we're able to measure the performance. Is the economy going forward or is it going backwards, right? So that's the whole idea of national income accounting. So let's see, let's look at some statistics for us. This table below shows the GDP and GDP per capita. So you're looking at GDP. Let's talk about what is GDP, GDP per capita. GDP is the gross domestic product. GDP per capita talks about the per capita income. We'll talk about it later. But let's look at these estimates. Look at, we have countries in Africa, their are ranks, and they are, so we have the rank countries, the nominal GDP, or what is it, GDP, in billions of dollars, and we have their nominal GDP per capita income, or let's say just per capita income, or let's say just GDP, right? Let's make things easy for us. So let's say the GDP. Let's say just GDP, right? So GDP. And this is what? GDP per capita. Right? So GDP per capita in US dollars. Let's get a country. If you take Nigeria, for instance, Nigeria was the first country. This estimate in 2000 and estimate that was obtained from the World Bank in 2000, 2001. 2001 estimates from the World Bank, the country's performance. This was Nigeria's performance. Nigeria had $480.8 billion. That means if you, what is the, the value of Nigerian economy? What was their productivity in 2001? Nigeria has about 230 population. In 2001, their productivity of the whole country, their oil, their gold, everything put together, and all the people in the country, their productivity was $480.8 billion. So let me say, let's say it figuratively. If you have $480 billion last year, you, could have, you, it, it, you can use that to buy Nigeria. That's the value of the whole economy in 2001. And your yeah, per capita income, later we talk about per capita income, don't worry. 
per capita income was 2,278. So the, the GDP is divided by the country's population. So when it divided, the per capita income was 2,272.8. We'll talk about per capita income later. Well, per capita income help us to know whether the country is developing or not developing, right? So later we talk about what is per capita income, what it means. We have GDP have 396.33 billion, and the per capita income is 3,974.75. South Africa has 398.6. That was the third country. Egypt is second. South Africa third. 329.6 billion dollars. The per capita income was 6,102.7. Ghana was eighth in Africa with 775.4 billion dollars. That's the value of Ghana's economy in 2001. So if you have 80 billion dollars, you could have been able to buy Ghana in 2001. That's the whole value of the economy. And the per capita was 2,401, 431.10. So let me just uh, say something very quickly about per capita income so that I don't leave you. Per capita income. Per capita income is the income per head is the, in, is the income per head in the country. So per capita income per capita income is the GDP divided by the GDP divided by population. So what is the per capita income? Is the income N per head in the country in a year, right? So the income N per head in a country in a year. So the per capita income is equal to the country's Per capita income is equal to is equal to GDP divided by your population. So where's the per capita income? Later, we're going to learn how to calculate it. What is per capita income? In a year, how much is everybody in? In Nigeria, for instance, there are 230 million people. That means if you divide this the GDP by population, what you have is per capita income. What does it mean? It means that everybody in the country, on average, in 2001 and $2,272.84 dollars. $2,274.84. That means if you divide the country GDP by the population, everybody, what everybody earned on average in a year was $2,272.84. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody earned $2,272.84. Literally, because some people can earn more than that. Dango T can earn millions of dollars. Some people can earn equal to it. Some people can earn less than that. Some are children, they don't earn money. But we count them as part of per capita income. Some are aged, they don't work. But we count them as part. Because some people earn more than that. Some people earn less than that. Some people doesn't earn anything. Children are all part of the Nigerian's 230 million population. So if you strike the average, we are saying that on average, people earn more than that. People earn less than that. People earn more than that. People will not earn anything. Children are part. But on average, we assume that based on their GDP, in 2001, every Nigerian earned 2,772.8. It can go up, it can go down, depending on how the country is productive. Countries like South Korea, in 1950, their per capita income was, even Nigeria had per capita income better than them. But because of hard work and productivity now, their per capita income is around 60,000, 50,000. So the more your per capita income goes up, countries like US have 60,000, countries like Switzerland have about 70,000, uh, China have about 45,000, Germany about 50,000. The more the country is able to produce more, per capita income will go up. And that shows that you are a developed country. If you have about 60,000 or 70,000, you are a developed country. If you have about 10,000, you are a higher middle income country. If you have like 5,000, 6,000, you are a lower middle income country. If you have like 1,000, 2,000, you are 1,000 below, you are a developing country. So they used to classify people, countries. The higher per capita income, it means you are developed. The lower it is, it means that you are a developing country. So if you take that for if you take Nigeria, Egypt, and that, their per capita income, 2,000, 3,000, 2,000, they are classified as lower middle income country, right? So we have, we have this classification, right? We have developed country, 
develop, developed countries. You have developed countries. We have higher income countries, lower middle income countries, and developing countries. We have developed countries like the Americans and those have per capita income of 60,000. We have lower, higher middle income countries like countries like uh, countries like uh, you can take countries in Eastern Europe, uh, Croatia, and those type of countries. We have lower middle income countries like Ghana, Nigeria. We have developing countries or so, Somalia, Lesotho, and those type. The per capita is less than 1,000. This will might be around 2,000, 3,000. This will be around 10,000. This will be around 50, 40,000, 60,000. So the more the country works hard, you you move forward, right? So that's all. So that's just estimate for you. Let's look at what is the importance of the or the importance or usefulness of the national income estimate. Why is it necessary? Later, you're going to try to understand. You're trying. You're going to try to phantom. What is the relevance of the estimation, and what momentous role does this estimation plays uh, in our in our daily life? Let's see one. It helps us for measuring the performance of the sectors of the economy. So we see national income, national income calculator using output or product approach gives an idea of the performance of the various sectors of the economy. On a yearly basis, every country budget shows the performance of agri sector, manufacturing sector, service sector, contribution to GDP. So every country, we have how many sectors? Agri sector or primary sector, manufacturing sector, and services. What, was, what, what is the contribution of every sector? What is the contribution of every sector to GDP? What is the performance? So, when we do, we do the uh, national income account, maybe the product approach, we can know that this year, agri sector contributed more to the GDP, or manufacturing sector contributed more, or services contributed more. Why do you want to know? You want to know whether your economy depends on agri, or it depends on manufacturing, or it depends on services. What they call, in economic economy, structural transformation. Maybe my economy depends on agri, so I'm putting down measures to move it to manufacturing. So you know how which economy depends on Ghana. Now our economy depends more on uh, more on as uh, uh, services, right? Ghana economy now is more of services: teachers, nurses, police, insurance, shift. The economy is now more of services. In the past, it used to be a great sector. Let's go. Two thousand and one. Two thousand and one. The growth rate in Ghana, the economic growth, the economic growth rate was three point one percent. How the economy grow? The economy. Uh, increase by only 3.1 percent. Let's look at agri service sector contributed 45 percent to GDP. So if you take the GDP we had in 2001, that's 7.49 dollars. That's almost about 350 billion cities. That money we got, agri sector contributed 45 percent. The services sector contributed 45 percent. Industrial sector contributed 31 percent. Agri sector contributed. 24%. So it shows you that in 2001, Ghana's economy, service sector contributed more to GDP than the industrial and agri. Right? So this is, and why is it important? The leaders will sit down and think, how can we help grow maybe agri sector or service industrial sector so that maybe we want to move our economy to more industrial sector so that there will be more jobs because of the industries. So it gives us the leaders idea how to move the economy. Okay, so another importance of knowing the national income estimate is that one, comparing the performance of countries. The statistics help us to compare, help us to compare economic growth of one country with another. With the estimates of the national income of various countries, one can easily tell which country is more developed than the other. So one of the things is that how can I know that Nigeria is developed than Ghana, maybe the US is developed than Ghana, or maybe Japan is developed than maybe uh, maybe Turkey or what. You cannot just look at the country's population. Maybe when you go to Japan, their population is more than maybe, maybe Japan has more population than maybe Germany. So Japan is more developed than Germany. No, you can't do that. It's, it's quite, no, it's quite so sense, nonsensical to do that in economics. How will I know? I will, can only know by comparing their per capita income. So if my per capita income, one is 60,000, one is 40,000, 
then that'd be the 160,000, it's more developed than the 140,000. It's like age. If somebody's older than age, is more than, then you're older than the person. So help us to compare countries based on which one is more developed. So let's see that in 2005, estimates show, 2005 estimates shows that China had a per capita income of $9,000, and that, that of America was $55,000. We can easily conclude that in 2015, America was more developed than China, period. Not, maybe so China was, is about 2 billion people, and America is just about 320 million people. So uh, China is developed than America. No, it's about their per capita income. Your population should match with your productivity. So based on that, you can easily, uh, it's just very powerful that based on having this information, you know which country is more developed than the other. Three. A guide for foreign investors. National income estimate serve as a guide for foreign investors. Foreign investors take a lot of things into consideration when investing in a, in a, a country. One of them is the per capita income. Per capita income is a measure of the purchasing power of, the, of a country. It measures what the purchasing power of a country. A rise in per capita income means that market for goods and services are higher and these attract more investors into the economy. We're going to, when somebody wants to invest into the economy, there are a lot of uh, plateau of things, a plateau of factors. There are a lot of factors, numerous factors they will take into cognizance or they take into consideration. One of them is your per capita income. Why? If your per capita income is high, it means that the country have higher purchasing power. When it's higher purchasing power, it means, purchasing power means your ability to buy goods and services. If I earn 10,000 and you earn 2,000, I have higher purchasing power. Why? I have more money to buy goods and services. So purchasing power is your ability to buy goods and services. So if I'm going to invest in a country and I see that one country has per capita income of 60,000, one have 2,000, it tells me the country have 60,000, the citizens has a lot of money, they have a lot of money to buy my goods. Patently, obviously, patently, you can see that uh, one country, if I go invest, the citizen can buy my goods in another country. So let me move my investment there. So if I'm an investor, there are a lot of things investors take into cognizance or they take into consideration. One of them is foreign diet. One of them is the per capita income. So that they know which country they can easily move your investment. What they call capital flight, where you move your investment to. Let's look at something. 2000, from 2000, let's get foreign diet investment in Ghana from 2000, 2014, 2019. In, let's do that in billions of dollars. In 2014, Ghana received foreign direct investors. Investors that came from outside to invest. How much did you receive? People come from Europe, in America, in the Caribbean, in the Scandinavians, Latinos. They came to invest. Money they brought in Ghana to invest was $3.6 billion. In 2015, it was $3.19 billion. In 2016, $3.49 billion. In 2017, $3.2.5 billion. 2018 was $2.99 billion. And 2019, $3.88 billion. Thus, people came from outside and brought their money into the country to invest in factories, in schools, in the hospital, in the hotels, in motels, in fish, flora courts, aquaculture, jewelry, pharmaceutical. This money that came from outside to invest in Ghana. That's so, it gives us an idea about some of these things that dry, dry this thing to the country, it says, of, it says as a sort of a bite that drive things, these things we need to actually integrate and pregnant into our minds so that we understand things very, 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 very well. We can easily phantom or understand things very articulate when we understand these issues very well. So it helps us to compare the standard of living of a country. So the same country can compare the country. So let's see, one of the most important use of national income estimate is comparing standard of living of the same country over, over time to measure the rate of economic growth. So even if you're comparing a country, for instance, in Ghana, by March, you are 65 years. You're going to have 65, 2022, 65 years. Okay, you can compare from 1960, 2022. Has Ghana improved? How can we know? Per capita income. Maybe 2016, 20, 1960, uh, per capita income maybe 300 Ghana cities. Today, our per capita is 2,700 Ghana cities, 2,200 Ghana cities. We can compare the country over the period, the standard of living from 1960 to 19, 2022, 1956, we had the independence, 1956, we had the independence, 2022, 50, 67 years, 65 years. Have we moved forward? 1957 to now, have we moved forward? Have we moved backward? 1957 to uh, 2,065 years. So you can compare the per capita income over the period. Have we moved forward or we have moved backwards? Right? Uh -huh. So, example, Ghana's per capita income in 2000 
was $1,299, whilst in 2017 was $2,704. All things being equal, we, can, we expect that the standard of living in 2017 is better than 2010. So if the per capita income in 2017 was 2,074, and that one is 2,010 in Ghana, we can argue all things being equal. I'm saying all things being equal because sometimes it doesn't follow that logic. We expect that people's standard of living in 2017 should be better than 2010. All things being equal, if things work perfectly, based on the per capita income. Five, it is a tool for economic planning. Statistics, the statistics serve as a useful tool for economic planning. Knowing just your country's per capita income is not enough, but putting down sound policies to move the country higher is the most important. So if the country, you know your per capita income, it's not enough. Maybe, maybe Ghana is 2,000, per capita income is 2,200. Why? It should, it should push you, right? There should be some sort of agility, something that will move you to move the country's per capita income forward. Maybe it's 2,000 today, maybe you don't like it. We want to move it to maybe 10,000, 20,000 in the next 10 years. So you give you an idea. What do you do? You sit down and formulate policies. China, for instance, in 1978, they formulated and implemented a development plan from 1978 to 2018. It was a 40 development plan that this way our economy is. We don't like it. We want to move on and be like the Americans. People thought they cannot do it. And they led, it led to investment in foreign trade. Invest, there was investment. They moved from more, they moved to, there was foreign, foreign trade, investment. They moved to free market reforms, from socialist to more free market reforms, where the private sector was given a key role. They also moved to the level of education infrastructure in agri. And look at what happened. They, in, they invested in education infrastructure over the period, look at it, for a period of 40, 40 years, China has leaf flock. They are able to leave, lock, leave flock China has able to leave flock. Leave flock means they are able to go ahead of other countries. Now, China is better than countries like Ukraine, Russia, a lot of Turkey, countries that they were behind. China was behind them. Now, they are able to leave flock them. A lot of countries, by lifting about 800 million people out of poverty, they got to know their per capita income was no good. Okay, let's sit down, let's develop our country. Let's sit down, 40 years plan. Let's invest in infrastructure, agri, in the education, and they work very hard. Now, they have made it. When they say they will make a car, every day they cannot make a car. Korea also, after the 1953 Korea war, said we will not go for any war again. After North Korea, South Korea, or South Korea said no war again. 53, they sat down, put plans together, America gave them money, and now North Korea also have developed. Before that, Nigerian economy was better than South Korea in 1950. Ghana's economy was better than Malaysia in 1957. Now all this country, South Korea, Malaysia, China, have lived flock all of us. They call them Asian miracle countries. But they are produced, they able to produce that potential role when it comes to moving the economy to that level. Now China talks, everybody is afraid because they put down measures. So it's also a guide for all our countries to know your per capita income, sit down, try to formulate policies, integrate, impregnate all these policies in the scheme of things, and move your country to that level. Can Africa also do that? Of course we can do that. If you put ourselves together very well, we are more serious, very uh, forward thinkers, we are forward, forward thinkers, critical thinkers, generational thinkers, global influential thinkers. We work hard, we, tell, we can also do it. So that's one of the relevance of knowing these uh, estimates. Again, another importance of the national income estimate is that contribution to international organization. National income, national income estimate provide information about how organizations such as African Union, United Nations, UN, Eco Economic Community of West African Country, ECOWAS, are financed. Rich countries usually contribute more to the budget of such organizations than the poorer countries. So when you take such organizations, right, when you take such organizations, every, every year what happens is that countries have, have to contribute to their, have, have to contribute, every year we contribute. How does these countries get money to finance their activities? Every, every country in the world will contribute their quota to it. You make contribution. When it belongs to the group, what do you do? You make contribution. The contribution they make to the is based on the country's per capita income. So if Ghana wants to give money to have to pay contribution to UN, ECOWAS, it's based on their per capita income. Countries that have a rate of pay higher than Ghana are less, for instance. So Armenia, Armenia in 2002, their contribution to the UN was 200 and $201,087. That's their contribution. Kazakhstan, 
The contribution was $3 million, $3 million, $3 million, $3,820,651 was a contribution to the UN. In 2002, Portugal. Portugal, their contribution was seven. It is useful for budgeting policies, for budgetary policies. It's useful for budgetary policies. Modern government prepared their budgets within the framework of national income data and tried to formulate anti-cyclical policies. So, first, what are anti-cyclical policies? We are going to talk about it. According to the facts reviewed by the national income estimate, even taxation borrowing policies are also framed as to avoid fluctuations fluctuations in the national income. So, if the country knows its per capita income, when they are preparing budget, they found it's being, uh, it's being integrated or it's being impregnated into it. If our per capita income last year was very low, we, need, we want to borrow. We have to borrow so that it be proportional to what we need. That's called anti-cyclical policies. Maybe last year, our per capita income was very low, GDP was very low, we need to borrow. How much do we need to borrow so that we don't put the country in inflation? You see that all these things should be integrated, it should be impregnated into the national framework and policy that are being formulated to deal with these things, to help reduce or to help attenuate the side effect. So before government can do any, any of these things, it take all these things into cognizance or take them into consideration. So look at the statistics, for instance, in the budget of Ghana 2002, government expenditure is, in 2002 is expected to increase by almost 13% relative to Relative to 113.8 billion, billion expenditure in 2001. So, in government expenditure in Ghana, where government is targeting 30% relative increase, they have to take into cognizance when it comes to uh, the country's GDP that they want to increase expenditure so that it will be more above this. Why? They want to increase government spending so that they can increase the GDP. So, government take all those things into cognizance, or they take them into consideration, in other words. Eighth, the last point, assessing the role of the public and the private sector in the economy. National income figures enable us to know the relative roles of public and private sectors in the economy. If most of the activities are performed by the state, we can easily conclude that the public sector is playing a dominant role. The same can be said of the private sector. So we can know which are the, in the country have private sector, the public sector. If we come to Ghana, public universities, when they want the best public investors, they are government. When it comes to primary, GSS, secondary, primary, GSS, we want the best schools, they are private. We have hotels for government, hotels for private. We have restaurants for government, restaurants for private. Want, every country have that thing, right? So we want to know which sector, does the private sector contribute more to GDP or is the public sector? And before the Soviet Union, before the Soviet Union, those Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine, today call them Russia, Ukraine, there was a government that was contributing more, right? After the, after the move away from government controlling more, allow the private sector, private, private, what they call privatization, that's where we have more private sector in the Russia, Ukraine economy. That's where you have this Russian, we call them Russian oligarchs. The Russian oligarchs. That's where this private the Russian oligarchs, where they moved to more of a private sector driven, where the private sector got a chance. Whether these private Russian oligarchs were rich men who moved the country, took some of the state assets and moved it into the private sector. So we're able to know which sector is contributing more. Statistics, let's go. Statistics from Ghana Statistical Survey GSS indicates that, indicates that the private sector contributed 71% to GDP in 2017. In economic areas like real estate, education, retailing, wholesaling, communication, insurance, transport, and others. In Ghana, for instance, the private sector is dominant. They have that, they play that, but stalwart role when it comes to uh, dictating for the economy. So we have seen the importance why we have to know our national income, right? We have given you eight importance. Maybe in exam, they can ask you to write four or five. We are giving you, we are giving you more with statistics and figures so that you can try to make your, make your explanation very juicy. We're going to move on to talk about other issues that bothers on this topic. So one of the things that we're going to look at it is very palpable, it's very obvious, is the three approaches. We're going to estimate the per capita income, but we're going to use three approaches. So let's look at some gist about the approaches. 
The national income can be estimated using three approaches. Expenditure approach, income approach, and product approach. Product, we call it other products, output or value added approach. Right? So later you're going to pick them one by one, look at the formulas, look at the uh, calculations, we solve more calculations and give you some to try on your own. Let's look at the expenditure approach. This estimation approach focuses on the spending of the three agents of the economy, household, firms, and government. So when it comes to the expenditure approach, we have every economy, as we all know, we have only three economic agents. We have the household, the firms, the government that encapsulates the whole economy. So what we look at it, we look at the spending, household, we spend. Who is household? I'm a household, you're a household. Firms, companies, gossip, MTN, Nestle Ghana, they are company, they also spend. Government, Akufado's government, Joe Biden's government, Margaret Thatcher's government, they also do spend. So you look at the spending of the firms, the household, and government. What about income approach? This estimation approach considers incomes from factors of production. Example, wages and salaries, allowances, directors, remuneration, dividend, corporate, profit, and others. So with the income approach, you look at incomes in. What are incomes in? Money in. Like wages and salaries. Allowances, you know allowances. When you earn, every, every month they give you some allowances, some money you keep on yourself, outside your salary. Directors, remuneration. Managers, their salaries and allowances. Dividend, companies. If you have shares in MTN. When the year ends, they give you money for your share. Your share, share is just a financial asset. You can go and buy shares. If you buy shares, that means a financial asset, you own the shares. When the year ends and they make profit, they'll give you your part. So what you get is called dividend. We have corporate profit. Corporate profit are profit made by companies like Nestle Ghana Company, companies like Stambic Bank, Vodafone, companies like uh, Japan Royal, and also more textiles. They are corporate profit. So we are looking at income approach. We are looking at incomes earned in the country by the household, by the firms, and government. So we see that we try to embody everything there and see the assemblage of all this information from income. So this one we focus on income. This one we focus on expenditure. Also, let's get another one. We have what we call the product output or value added approach. This approach, this estimation approach, deals with the productivity from all sectors of the economy. Next, that is the primary or agri sector, secondary or manufacturing sector, or tertiary or services. So, with the products or output or value added approach, we're looking at the productivity. Productivity of what? The agri sector, productivity of. So, you're going to like what the agri sector, the fishing, the farming, and all those things. Those who farm rice, sugar, those who sugar cane, those who farm. Coffee, mango, everything, the agri sector. Secondary sector, manufacturing com companies, coming up with this Unilever, Nestle Gan, Akosumu Textiles, a pro Promesidor company, all those things are that. We're going to look at their productivity, tertiary services, services, those who are teachers, nurses, insurance, shipping, banking, banking. So we have the, the sectors, we have the primary agri sector, those who farm, sugar, cotton, coffee. Secondary sector of manufacturing companies, Promesidor, when we come to Nestle Ghana, Unilever, and those companies. We have the tertiary of services, those who render services, education, farm, education, insurance, transport, banking, and all those are part. So what we want to see, so if we are looking at the expenditure approach, you're looking at the spending of household, firms, and government. Income approach, you're looking at the incomes, earnings. Product approach, you're looking at productivity of who? Primary or agri sector, secondary or manufacturing, or tertiary or services. Let's take key notes of this. Let's note. It is always expected that when a student is giving values from these three estimation approaches, put together in one question, students are expected to use the formula for these three approaches separately. At the end of the calculation, we expect the final values of the three approaches to be equal. Here, maybe it might not apply to you in the secondary school. We are doing the video also for those in the university. Sometimes, in a question, they can give you items on product approach, income approach, product approach. They can mix all the items. But in secondary school, I've seen that WASI doesn't do that. 
items, transaction from expenditure approach, income approach, and also from uh, product approach. They can assemblage it. You can see assemblage of that. It can be encapsulated, right? But so when you are solving, you solve expenditure, you take the item for expenditure approach, you solve it separately. You pick the items from income approach, you solve it separately. You pick item from product approach, you pick it. You solve it separately. So you solve it separately for expenditure, income, and product. When you finish, the answers should be the same. But no, you don't, if you're, in, you're doing writing, WASI, don't worry. What's the question? They don't ask that. But those who are in the university can think about that. When you finish, the answers should be the same. And you want to find out, you want to find out what is actually the reason. Try to expand on, try to explain what actually accounts for that. And you want to use what they call the circular flow of income. Circular flow of income is basically an interaction between the household and the firms. Who is the household? I'm the household. Unilever is a firm. Let's look at what we have here. Let's look at the arrow. You should know where the arrow is moving, where the arrow is coming from, right? That should be something you should try to understand very explicably. Household. Household supply the firms with factors of production. You see the arrow? It moved from the household and it's moving to the firm. We supply them factors of production. What are factors of production? We supply them with labor. If I go and work for you, labor, I'm giving them my labor. We supply them with raw materials. We supply them with water. We supply them with what? Uh, land. If today you finish school and go and work for Unilever, what are you supplying? Your factors of production. So the household supply the firms with what? Factors of production. What do the firms use the factors of production for? They use it to produce goods and send it back to the household. Here, we are assuming that it's between, the interaction is between household and firms. There's no government, there's no export, there's no input. It's a very simple analysis just to try to make things very, very explicable for us so that we can actually phantom what is going on. So the household supply the firms with factors of production. The firm uses to produce goods and send it to them. So you see that the arrow is moved from the firms to the household. What do we see? When the household supply the firms with factors of production, is it for free? It's not for free. Do you pay them? When they supply them with factors of production, the firms pay them. You see, arrow from, from firms to what? Household, what? Payment on factors of what production. So the firms are paying them. The arrow is moved from the firms to what? The household. If they go and work for Unilever, will you work there for free? No. They will pay you. If you go to a uh, this KFC, Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken, the CEO in US, it takes $14.2 million a year for his salary and allowances. So it's not for a joke. So he's being paid. He supplies service to KFC. At the end of the day, they pay him. You don't mean it. Right? So, the household supply the firms for the factors of production and the firms pay them on the factors of production. When the household also supply the firms with goods and services, it's not for free. The firms also use the money they got from the, the household, use the money they got from the firms. When they supply the factors of production, that money they got, they use it to pay for the goods. So it's like a cycle. I give you factors of production, you pay me, you give me goods, I use the money to pay you back. It's a very simple analysis. We are assuming you don't invest, you don't save. All that the household receive, they used to buy goods, and all that they get go back to the firms, and that, that, that goes that way. It's like a cycle, a very simple analysis. So let's see. As already explained, let's see. From the circular flow of income, the household supply firms with factors of production. The firms use these factors of production to produce goods and send it back to the households. That's already told you. When the household supply the firms with factors of production, they pay this ha household with incomes. On the other hand, when the household receives their finished goods from the firms, they make payment on these goods with the income they receive from the firms. This simply means that all the factors of production, all the factors of production is used to produce goods and services. So the factors of production they use it to what? Produce goods and services. That's product approach. All the income received by the household, all the income household received, they spent it on goods and services supplied by the firms. So the income they receive, when the firms supply them with goods, they use the income to spend on it. If you want to relate to the three approaches we have there, we are trying, why? We are trying to use it to understand the three approaches over here. Relating this to the three approaches, what does, this, what does it mean? What, what we can say is that all the commodities produced, that's the product approach, 
is consumed with expenditure by the household. So all the product produced, all the products, is being consumed with expenditure. Expenditure from who? The household. That's the expenditure approach. This expenditure made by the household emanate from their income they receive from the firms. So you see that all the goods produced, the firm spends on the good. So all the goods produced, that's the product approach, productivity. The firm household spends on the good. That's the expenditure approach. And all the expenditure the firm make, they get they make it from the incomes they receive. The income approach. So it means that the product approach. The expenditure approach and income approach, when you work them, if they give you a question and all the transactions are in, you pick them, you do the product approach separate, you pick the transaction, you do the expenditure approach, income approach separate. When you finish, it should be the figure should be equal based on the explanation. All the goods produced, product approach, consumers spend on it. That's the expenditure approach. What do they spend from? They spend it from the income they receive from the firms. So the product approach should be equal to the expenditure approach, the expenditure approach should be equal to income approach. So if you are in secondary school, don't worry about this. But those who are in universities, when you go into any exams, they give you items. They have mixed the item from product approach, expenditure, income approach. I saw the product approach separate, expenditure separate, income separate. When I finish, the answer should be core. And this is the reason why I gave you. Excluded from national income estimation. When you are doing national income estimation, there are some items when you see them, you don't add it to the calculation. Why? Let's see. One is the sale of used goods. GDP measures current production, that is occurring during the current year. The sale of used product do not enter into the current years, current years estimation because they were counted first when they were when they were originally acquired. For example, Odro bought an air conditioning in 2008 for in 2008 for 2000. He later sold it to Abuaje 2016. Their conditioner cannot be counted again in 2006 because it has already been counted in 2008. So what are we saying? Secondhand products. Secondhand product. If I bought a car, used product, I bought a car, like we're using this example, Odro. He bought an air conditioner in 2008, maybe 2000 Ghana cities. And in 2006, he sold it to Abuaje in 2016. When Odro bought the air conditioner in 2008, the value of the air conditioner was added to that year's GDP. If now you have sold it to Abuja 2016, you cannot add the you can add the value of the air conditioner to 2016 GDP. Why? It's double counting. Something that was counted in 2008 have been counted in 2016. Right? So since it has already been counted for when it was first bought in 2008, it doesn't make any it doesn't make sense. It's quite preposterous to add it to 2016's estimation because it become one thing have been counted in 2008, and the same thing have been counted in 2016, and that does not make sense at all. So second-hand products are excluded from the estimation to avoid double counting. Look at trading of financial assets. Trading of financial assets, financial assets like treasury bills, notes, stocks, and bonds. For what is treasury bills? Treasury bills are financial assets. So uh, if you say that you yeah, can go to commercial bank, I have six thousand or ten thousand, I want to buy a treasury bill. Is that you give them the money, they give you that treasury bill. It's like a document. I'm buying for six months. Treasury bills are for short, short term, three months, six months. When you buy six months time, you when six months that they will pay you interest. If it's ten percent or fifteen percent, they will pay you interest. After that, they give you back your money. So if you have money that is idle, don't go and put it in your account. Go and use to buy treasury bill. Go to commercial bank. Go to stamp bank. Go to ADB, ADB bank. Go and buy it and use that. Also, we have notes. Notes are also financial assets, like treasury bill, but notes are for one year. If you want to buy notes, when you go there, it will last for one year before you get the interest and you get your money back. So it's also financial, but it lasts for long. Treasury bills are only for six months, three months, but notes is for one year. One year time, you get your money back and your money, and your, your you get the interest and the money. What are bonds? Bonds is also a financial instrument, but it's for a long period. Bonds can be 15 years. 10 years, 20 years, what they call something, if government is floating bonds, maybe government is floating bonds, 700 million Ghana cities, you have 2 million or 4 million Ghana cities, you go and buy it. Every year, government will pay you an interest. It's for 10 years. Every year, government will pay you interest. When the 10 years is due, government will pay your money back. So some people who have stolen gun, they can't raise money, they use that to go and buy those things. In Europe, they have a euro bond or sovereign bond where people buy those bonds in overseas. They go and buy it 
maybe 10 years, 15 years, every year, government will pay them interest. Maybe I'll have $4 million, I'll go and buy it. Every year, maybe I'll get 10%. 10 percent Ten percent will be 400000 every year, interest. When the 10 years is due, government will pay me my money back. But bonds are for long term. Seven years, 10 years, 15, you have 20 years, you have centurion bonds, 100 years, 50 years. If it's for centurion, in Ghana, for instance, our bonds are 7, 10, 15 years. We don't have 20, 25. Most of our bonds are 8 years, 9 years, 15 years. Right? We have stocks. Stocks are shares. When you hear that MTN is floating shares, you go and buy one so that at the end of the day, when the year ends, they are giving you profit out. They give you yours. So these are financial assets. We have other financial assets. We cannot talk about the options and plenty of them. Let's leave it here at the level. So trading of financial assets is the buying and selling of these assets at the stock exchange. The trading of stocks and bonds are not counted in the GDP because they, are not, they do not represent production of new assets, but the trading of existing financial assets. Let's take somebody like, somebody like Steven. Steven, when, you buy, when I go and buy a bond or shares, if I'm not interested in the gain, if the bond is for 10 years, I'm, I'm not interested in the gain, I can sell it to somebody, I can sell it to Steven. When you go, they give you bro uh, those brokers. Right, brokers and those people, job, 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 jobbers. I bought a bond from government of Ghana. I'm not interested. I want to sell it. Okay, they look for somebody who is interested in the sell it. Those stock brokers. Or oh, I bought a share in MTN shares. I'm not interested in the shares again. If you are not interested in the shares, they look for somebody who is interested and they sell it to him. So if you do that, it's trading. What you are transferring your financial asset to another person. When you first bought the financial asset, if I bought it 2010. When I bought it from MTN, offer, it was added to that year's GDP. So if now, you say you're not interested and you're selling it in 2020, it should not be counted again in 2020. Why? Because it doesn't match a new asset. It's an old asset. You're just transferring it. When you just bought it in 2010, it was added to that year's GDP. So now if today you're not interested again in 2020, you're selling it. You don't need to add it to the year's GDP. Become double counting, right? And that will, not, that will actually mirror the true reflection of the GDP. Why are we doing this? We are trying to avoid double counting so that we don't actually mirror, or actually we don't become, it doesn't become a sort of a Herculean tax. We don't, so that we can know the true value of the GDP without any double counting over, over estimation, so that we know what is the true value of the GDP. Third, we have the government transfer payment. Government transfer payment is a payment made by government to person that does not, that does not correspond to any, go, any goods or service provided by the recipient. Government transfer payment include income support to the aged, the widows, poor, unemployment, benefit, others. They are not counted in the GDP because they do not match with productivity of the uh, recipients. Example of, example, of Ghana, example of Ghana, the government of Ghana income support to the poor. We call it LIB, livelihood empowerment against poverty. Livelihood empowerment against poverty. What is government transfer payment? Government, some money government give to people, government think maybe they are economically disadvantaged, right? People, government, the money, amount of money government give to people, they think maybe these people, they are in need, they are widows, they are poor, they are aged, they are economically disadvantaged. Government want to support them, or they are unemployed. In some countries, when you are not working every month, government gives you some amount of money. In the US, I think it's about, it's about $300 or every month. In US, when you have, if you are earning less than sixty-five thousand dollars in a year, if they put your salary together in a year, you earn less than sixty-five thousand dollars. The government give each of your child two hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred and fifty, two hundred and fifty dollars. I think they are moving to three hundred dollars under Joe Biden. So if my salary is below sixty-five thousand dollars, and I have fortune. All my fortune and every month, government give everyone three hundred thousand dollars, three hundred, three hundred, three hundred, sorry, three hundred dollars. So if you have fortune, I'm going to get thousand two hundred dollars every month. Government is giving it to you just to cushion you, take off the children because your salary is low. These are transfer payment. Why we don't add? If you receive such money, you don't add it to GDP. Why don't we add it? The money you receive it doesn't match with productivity. If government says that you are not working. So he's giving you some amount of money, or your agent, or your widow. He's giving you some money to support you. The money you receive, you didn't work for it. GDP talks about productivity. You didn't work for the money. So we cannot add that money value to the GDP. Right? It doesn't reflect productivity. If 
If I work for the government, they pay me, they can add it to GDP because I work for it. It's productivity. And they have added it. But if you receive money without working for it, it's something like government is trying to support you because maybe probably your economic disadvantage. It should not be added to the year's GDP. So in, we have in Ghana what we call the livelihood empowerment against poverty. That was introduced in around 2007, 2006 by the then MVP government. The late ban review that people are poor from poor homes, sorry. They give them amount of money every month to support them. And the government has been doing that consistently for more than 16, 16 years now. They give them some more small amount of money. Government give them from poor homes to support them. In in US, they have unemployment benefits. In UK, it costs something fair long. Fair long is also money government give to people who are in it. So in everywhere in the world, they do those things to support people who are economically. That's such a money is we call them government transfer payment. And it's not added to their year GDP because the money they receive does not match with productivity. We have intermediate product. Intermediate products are output of a firm that become the input for another firm. A typical example is wheat, which is a flour, is used for production of wheat, which is a raw material, is used for the production of flour, and the flour is then used for baking bread. With this example, the wheat and the flour are intermediate product, while the bread is the final product. The essence of economic activity is for the production of the final product. With intermediate product, just being eight steps in getting the right product, only the final product is included in a year's GDP to avoid double counting. So, for instance, when you say intermediate product, you have wheat, you turn the wheat into flour, and you turn the flour into bread. What is the final product? The final product is the bread. The wheat and the flour were intermediate product. They were, they were product that helped us to get the bread. So you cannot count wheat and add it to GDP, count flour, add it to GDP and count the bread. What have you counted? I counted something three times. You count wheat, flour, and bread. No, we don't do that. It's double, it's double counting. If the wheat was turned into flour, the flour into bread. So what do we add is the flour. The flour is the, is the final product. The wheat and the flour are intermediate product. In other case, they use what we call value added. If they don't even use the bread, they use what we call value added. Value added is that from wheat, We can use something like wheat, from wheat to flour, from flour to bread. What do you call value added? What is the value? Okay, so what this is this called value added? From wheat, maybe the wheat was 10,000 cities, 10, cities. When it moved to flour, value have been added. They have done something to it. Maybe they moved to 17,000. When you move from flour to bread, now I move maybe 25,000 because something has been added to it. So value has been added. From here to here, value that added is what? 7,000. From here to here, value that is added is what? 8,000. So if they don't want to use the final product here, they can use the value added. They take this one, 10,000, plus the value added, 7,000, plus the value added, 8,000, you get 25,000. That's equal to the final product. So if you don't want to use the final product for the estimation, you can use the value added. That's why they, call, they have the VAT, value added tax. V, VAT, value added tax. So the tax should be on, from here to here, what is the value added? 7,000, the tax should be on the 7,000. From 17,000 to 25, what value have been added? 8,000, the tax should be on the 8,000, right? So in summary, intermediate products are not used for that. If you want to use them, you have to use the value added. Add it to the original and then add the value. Or use the final product. But don't count the wheat, the flour, and the bread. Otherwise, you do double counting. And that affects the estimation. We want to avoid all this one we are doing. We are trying to avoid that we don't get any estimation that does not reflect the economy. That we take away double counting so that every figure we get will reflect, will be a good reflection, it will be a good... reminiscence of the economy, right? And see how the economy is performing. Income from illegal activities. Illegal activities are economic activities that are not backed by law. Hence, income from such activities should not be included in the national income estimate. In Ghana, for instance, prostitution, drug trafficking, child trafficking, are examples of illegal activities in the economy. So, activities that are illegal, 
if you are doing cocaine business, you make three million dollars or three billion dollars. You do try trafficking. Whatever amount of money you make, the country, the, the things the country say they are illegal. Once they are illegal, you don't add their, their money you make from that to the national estimation. Because the country don't see those things as illegal as legal. Prostitution in some countries is legal. Yeah, people are prostitutes, they pay taxes, everything. But in Ghana, in most African countries, prostitution is illegal. So these items are excluded from the estimation because they overestimate the GDP, and that does not give us the true reflection of how the economy is performing. So if you're doing estimation, see these items, you shouldn't include them in the estimation. So we are now going to look at, take them, expenditure approach, product approach, income approach, and solve each one by one. We look at the formulas, we solve uh, two examples. I give you some to try. They move on to another one, another one, another one, another one. It's a very lengthy topic, and you're going to take most of your time to help you to try to expand on these issues, expand on it, try to find them and get things explicably very well.